you know a little bit about angular momentum now in quantum mechanics. In particular, the spin one-half system, and how it can be represented mathematically, how it behaves, how to analyze it. You also remember a little bit about the experiments that can be done to study, for instance, the spin one-half system. In the stern gerlach experiment, for example, you have a magnetic field, a non-uniform magnetic field in particular, and if you shoot particles in from one side, they will either be deflected up or down, depending on whether they're spin up or spin down. I hand-waved terribly when I described the initial particles here, though. The initial particles, typically for the stern gerlach experiment, are silver atoms. And silver atoms are not something that we know how to represent quantum mechanically. They're very complicated. There's lots of electrons, there's lots of protons, and lots of neutrons. How can something like that overall behave simply like a spin one-half system? That has to do with how angular momenta add together in quantum mechanics. I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface of addition of angular momentum. There's actually a lot of deep mathematics that goes in here, and you'll get a feel for some of that. But the simplest case, and what we're going to start with, is two spin one-half systems. Suppose I have two spin one-half systems, and I'd like to combine them together to find out the behavior of the total angular momentum, for instance. Spin one-half systems, you know how they behave. They're either going to be up or down. And if I'm going to have two spin one-half systems, I'm going to write that, for instance, as two arrows inside my cat. So up, up, or up, down, or whatever. The possibilities that we have, if we've got two up spins, two down spins, one up, one down, etc., are either up, 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 down, down, up, or down, down. Just the two, the, the four possibilities for either up or down. If you think about the total angular momentum of these states, what we're thinking about in the context of total angular momentum, let's think about just the z component of the total angular momentum of these combined particles. I'm going to write this as s sub z superscript 1 plus s sub z superscript 2 for z component of the angular momentum of the first arrow in this state, the first particle, and the z component of the angular momentum of the second particle. For instance, if I'm looking at the expected value of the angular momentum of, or sorry, the angular momentum z component associated with this sum, I'm going to say s sub z applied to this. Well, the s sub z2 isn't going to do anything with this. It's only going to focus on this, whereas s sub z1 is going to focus on this. So what we're going to end up with for this would give us 1 half, sorry, h bar over 2 minus h bar over 2 would give us 0 for the z component of the angular momentum associated with this state. You can make the same sort of argument for the other angular momenta under the, for these other states. This one is going to give us a total z angular momentum of 1, this one 0 as we said, this one 0 as well as we said for pretty much obvious reasons. If this is going to be plus, this is going to be minus, summing to 0, then this being minus and this being plus, summing to 0 as well. Two downs gives us a minus 1. This is vaguely reminiscent of the angular momentum structure we had when we were working with uh, spin 1, for instance. We have 1, we have 0, we have minus 1, but we actually have two zeros here, so something's not quite working out. The way to treat this mathematically is to consider lowering operator applied to this up-up state. Now, the lowering operator that I'm going to work with here, s minus, is going to be broken up in the same sort of way as this s sub z. So let's write this as s sub minus on 1 plus s sub minus on 2. Don't think this is s sub minus squared, this is s sub minus acting on the second particle in my combined quantum state. So if I actually do that, let's write it out s sub minus, act, sorry, s sub minus 1 plus s sub minus 2 acting on my up, up quantum state. Well, s sub minus 1 is going to lower the first, s sub minus 2 is going to lower the second, but they're combined with the plus sign here. So what I'm going to end up with is going to be something like down up when I lower the first, plus up down when I lower the second. And if I want to properly normalize this, I'm going to need a 1 over root 2 outside to take care of half of this and half of this, essentially. So if I have up up, with total angular momentum, z component of angular momentum 1, 
And if I have these down up states, which I know have z component of angular momentum 0, what happens if I act my combined lowering operator on this state? Can I lower it once again and get minus 1? Indeed, I can. If you think about what <coughs> s minus 1 plus s minus 2, our combined lowering operator, acting on, I'll pull the 1 over root 2 out front, down, up, plus, up, down. If you think about what the lowering operator does to this, I'm going to have four separate terms when I make the distribution. An s minus applied to this, and applied to this, and an s minus 2 applied to this, and applied to this separately. But most of those terms end up being 0. If I apply s minus 1 to this state, the first particle here, the down arrow, is already in the lowest state that it can possibly be in. I can't lower a minus 1 half any lower for this spin 1 half system, which is what I'm working with. So this lowering operator applied to this is going to give me 0. Likewise, if I apply the lowering operator for 2 to the second state here, I'm going to get 0 as well, because I can't lower this second state any lower than it already is. Now if I apply the second lowering operator to the first state here, I'm going to convert this up into a down. And if I convert this, or apply this first lowering operator to the second state, I'm going to convert this up into a down. So the only thing I'm going to be left with is down down. And properly normalizing things is just going to be left with as down down. And if you calculate the total angular z component of angular momentum associated with this combined state, you find it has total z component of minus 1. So now we're talking. We have three states, 0, 1, and minus 1, z common to the angular momentum. And this looks a lot like the total angular momentum of 1. So it looks like we're talking about a state L, M of, you know, 1, and then either plus 1, 0, or minus 1 for M. S typical angular momentum. Uh, a spin 1 state, if you want to think about it that way. These are not the only possible states that we can make by combining these things, though. Since we have essentially four distinct states here, we would expect there to be four distinct states here. And indeed, just by orthogonality arguments, you can construct yet another state, 1 over root 2, and let's call it down, up, minus, up, down. If you calculate the z component of the angular momentum for this state, you'll find that it's 0. And if you actually try and calculate the raising and lowering operators applied to this state, you'll find that it doesn't work. The combinations that combined with the plus sign here to give me minus minus, when I lower both of these, are going to combine with a minus, or sorry, down down, are going to combine with a minus sign to give me 0. Essentially, if I try to apply the lowering operator to this state, for instance, lowering this gives me 0, lowering this gives me down, so I've got down, down. Lowering this gives me down, lowering this gives me 0, so I'm only going to be left with down, down. So I've got a down, down, minus, down, down. And the expansion overall is going to look very much like this, except instead of having a plus sign with the minus sign, you're going to get 0 when you apply the lowering operator. You're also going to get 0 when you apply the raising operator. So essentially, this state here looks like L and M of, let's say, 0 and 0. This looks like a spin 0 state. I can't raise or lower it to anything. These states are technically called the triplet and the singlet. So when I combine two spin 1 half systems like this, I get a group of three states that acts like a quantum mechanical system with L equals 1, coupled with, or combined with, a quantum mechanical system with L equals 0. Um, a little bit of notation here. If what I really want to do is combine two arbitrary quantum mechanical systems with spin up and spin down, or sorry, spin S1 and S2, the possible quantum mechanical systems that I'm working with as a start in terms of the spin is I've got a quantum mechanical system with spin S1 and Z component quantum number M1, and a quantum mechanical system with spin S2 and Z component quantum number M2. So I really have a system that can best be described by S1, M1, S2, M2. If I want to determine the total angular momentum, whereas for spin 1 half systems I got a, a triplet and a singlet, a spin 1 system and a spin 0 system, 
what I can actually get out of this is combined quantum mechanical systems with total angular momentum S1 plus S2, and then some quantum number associated with that M, being somewhere between S minus S1 plus S2 and plus S1 plus S2. This is an S2 here. I can also make quantum mechanical combinations with S1 plus S2 minus 1 for the total quantum or total uh, angular momentum and some associated m for that as well. I can continue as well also S1 plus S2 minus 2 if I have enough angular momentum for that. The structure that I'm trying to get at here is that if I have two angular momenta two arbitrary spins, S1 and S2, I can make a variety of quantum mechanical states. Uh, in the case of S1 and S2 equaling a half, I could make a triplet state with total Z component, maximum Z component value 1, which gave me 1, 0, and minus 1 allowed values for M, and a singlet state with 0 for the total angular momentum, and only one allowable state there. Um, as an example, suppose I want to combine a spin 3 halves mechanic quantum mechanical system with a spin 1 quantum mechanical system. You know your 3 halves quantum mechanical system has allowable z components of angular momentum 3 halves plus 1 half minus 1 half and minus 3 halves for a total of 4 states whereas your spin 1 quantum mechanical system has allowed z components of 1, 0, and minus 1 3 states. With this formalism here, you can convert the combination into a spin 3 halves plus 1, or into a spin 5 halves quantum mechanical state. 5 halves, if that's the total angular momentum, the z component of your total angular momentum is going to be 5 halves, or 3 halves, or 1 half, or minus 1 half, minus 3 halves, or minus 5 halves. So you actually have 6 states here. Or you can make a 3 halves quantum mechanical system with four states, or you can make a one-half total angular momentum quantum mechanical system with, well, two states. So when I'm combining a, a spin three-half system and a spin one-half system, it's not just going to be a triplet and a singlet. I'm going to get a five-halves or a three-halves or a one-half, depending on how I make superpositions of these quantum mechanical systems. Overall, however, you'll notice that if I have four states and three states, and I'm combining them independently, I'm going to end up with 12 states total, 3 times 4. Whereas, if I'm combining these states, these are independent, but they're not independent in a multiplicative sense. They're independent in an additive sense. There are, I can make five, six different states with this, four with this total, and two with this total. And if I have to add those up, you're going to get 12 states again. So the total number of states doesn't matter whether you're expressing it in terms of total L and total M or S1 and S2. The actual way in which you calculate how to express superpositions of S1 and S2 in terms of L and M uh, involves something called Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, and they're bloody complicated. This is a page from the Particle Data Group, which is a, a group of particle physicists which come up with sort of internationally accepted values for physical constants, for instance, like that g-factor number. You could go to their website and look it up. They also provide a lot of really nice documentation, including this, which is a page of, from one of their uh, quick reference guides. And the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients essentially allow you to calculate superpositions in terms of L and M, in terms of S1 and S2 states. For instance, we just talked about the superposition of spin one-half quantum mechanical system with spin one-half. So I'm sorry, not superposing, I'm combining two spin one-half systems. The notation here, M1 and M2, are then going to be the Z component quantum numbers associated with spin one-half and spin one-half. Whereas what they're calling J and M, those are quantum numbers associated with the combination, the combined angular momentum. So, for instance, spin one half, plus one half, and plus one half. This is essentially up and up. 
Up and up can combine to make a J, or total angular momentum, plus one, and have a Z component plus one in only one way. Essentially what this is telling you, this one here, it's telling you that up, up is equal to essentially one, one in this JM context. So S1 being up, S2 being up, is equivalent to L and M both being one. Now the numbers here are difficult to read because a square root sign is to be understood over every coefficient. For example, minus 8 fifteenths should be read as minus 8 fifteenths inside a square root. So the minus sign is outside and the square root is assumed. So for instance, if what I want to do is determine the behavior of the state lm is 1, 0, I want to write that as a superposition of s1, s2 sort of states. What I'm actually looking at is the 1, 0 L values. So I'm looking at this column here. So if I'm looking for 1, 0, I go for the 1, 0 in the superposition or combination that I'm interested in. And it tells me 1 half, 1 half, with they have the same sign. So what that tells me is that 1, 0 is going to be equal to 1 over root 2 for the assumed square root times up up, which is what you get, sorry, not up up, you have to look at the actual values of the table, Brent. So I'm going to have a 1 over root 2 and a 1 over root 2, and they're going to be combined with a plus sign. And the two states for m1 and m2 that are relevant are plus 1 half minus 1 half and minus 1 half plus 1 half. So I'm working with essentially up, down, and down, up for our quantum mechanical allowed states. So what this tells you is that the L equals 1, M equals 0 combined quantum mechanical state can be expressed as a superposition, an equal and same signed superposition of the up-down and down-up spin quantum number states, S1 and S2. You can do more complicated examples, for instance. Suppose I'm interested in expressing in a, a combination of spin 1 and spin 1 half a combined spin 1, spin 1 half quantum mechanical system. If what I'm interested in then is, for instance, the 3 halves minus 1 half total angular momentum state as a result of superposition of 1 and a half spin quantum states, I'm looking at these quantum numbers, the two, or these Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, 2 thirds and 1 third. What that tells you then is that L and M of 3 halves minus 1 half can be expressed as a superposition of 0 minus 1 half. So I'm going to have to write a new notation here, let's say 0 down for 0 minus 1 half, and minus 1 plus a half, minus 1 up. So 0 down and minus 1 up both contribute to a 3 halves total ang combined angular momentum minus one-half z component combined angular momentum. And they add together not equally in this case, but with two-thirds and one-third, which means I'm going to have to say root two over three and plus, since there's no minus signs in this column, one root one over three. So the notation here is complicated, and this is not something that we're going to be using a lot of, but this gives you a feel for the rich mathematical structure of combinations of angular momentum. This page, actually, I cut it off here. It goes down for uh, substantially higher orders. And, you know, characteristic of physicists always trying to be efficient, they've crammed definitions of the spherical harmonics into the gaps in between this rather stylistically described table. The moral of the story here is that if you want to express a combined angular momentum state in terms of the the uh, components that are being combined together, you can do so by looking up the numbers in this table, applying suitable minuses and pluses and square roots to get the overall definitions. Your textbook has a compressed version of this table, uh, but yes, at any rate, this shows some of the rich mathematical structure. Now, in the words of your textbook, if you think this is starting to sound like mystical numerology, 
What we are really talking about is the decomposition of the direct product of two irreducible representations of the rotation group into a direct sum of irreducible representations. You can quote that too to impress your friends. Uh, this is not me, this is Griffiths. And mystical numerology is really not that far from the truth. The question is, why does math work so damn well when it comes to quantum mechanics? Really, for instance, the origin of all of this is the relationship between symmetries and conservation laws. Uh, that's something called Noether's theorem, and I alluded it to it in class a while ago. What Noether's theorem tells us is that whenever there is a symmetry in physics, that implies a conservation law. For instance, what we've been talking about, conservation of momentum, we have some conserved L, that is equivalent to, or arises from, depending on your point of view, rotation symmetry. The fact that we can rotate our coordinate system however we want and not change the fundamental expressions of the laws of physics means we're going to have a conserved angular momentum. When it comes to the mathematical side, rotations, rotations form a group. Group theory then enters the picture. The mathematics of the rotation group is very rich. Um, in particular, the rotation group that we're working with is called SO3 in mathematical notation for the special orthogonal group in three dimensions, in this case. And, well, you can do lots of math with groups. In particular, groups have representations. And you can think about a representation of a group essentially as a set of matrices that obeys the same structure as the group that you're representing. And, well, Representations of groups have their own mathematics associated with them. For instance, you can talk about irreducible representations or direct products of irreducible representations. But there's a whole lot of math going on behind the scenes here in the construction of a table of Clubsch Gordon coefficients. And this, essentially, this very deep mathematical and physical connection between symmetries and conservation laws, and the mathematics of symmetries, the group theories of symmetries, in particular the rotation group and the representations of the rotation group in terms of matrices are essentially what give us angular momentum in quantum mechanics. The mathematics of angular momentum in quantum mechanics is essentially the mathematics of representations of the rotation group. So there's a lot of complicated math going on behind the scenes but those are some sentences in particular things that maybe will impress your friends if you tell them that you're learning about group theory and applying it to physics. At this level, there's not much more that I can tell you about group theory. Not because there isn't much more to group theory that's relevant to what we're talking about, but because it's been so long since I studied it. I did actually go and dig up my Representations of Finite and Compact Groups textbook and dig through to try and figure out if there was some nice tidbit that I could condense down. But, well, reading math textbooks isn't any fun. So, that's all you're going to get from me on this topic. Perhaps suffice it to say that the math actually does work, and there are very deep, very elegant connections between symmetries, conservation laws, rotation groups, and angular momentum. To check your understanding of all of this, here are some calculations that you can do. These just involve looking up numbers in the table of Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Now, if you're combining a spin-1 system and a spin-1 half system, you're going to be looking at that 1 times a half entries in the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient table. It might actually write it as one-half times one, I'm not sure. But you're going to be looking at that subtable. And I call these LM combined states. If L and M is going to be one-half, one-half, you're going to be looking at what in the particle data group Klebsch-Gordon coefficients is the JM column of one-half, one-half. And the corresponding rows are going to be these m1 and m2 values, and the coefficients that multiply the m1 and m2 values that appear in the corresponding rows are going to be the square root of the numbers with minus signs moved outside as appropriate. So here are two sample superpositions for you to look up in the table of Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Overall, what I really want you to take home from all of this is that angular momenta can be combined, the mathematics is complicated, and typically involves either doing some high-powered group theory or, for our purposes, looking numbers up in a table.